Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We have Dino here from Momentum Cyber. Dino, can you please introduce yourself and the company? Yeah, happy to. Hi, this is uh, Dino Bukuris. I'm one of the founding directors with uh, Momentum Cyber. Uh, we are a 100% cybersecurity focused advisory firm. Uh, many people know us, I would say, from our uh, research and some of the material that we put out there. We put you know, monthly cybersecurity snapshots, quarterly market reviews, and uh, you know, an annual Almanac special reports. Uh, we speak at cybersecurity conference like CyberTech in Tel Aviv, RSA, uh, and, and, and many other places. So really viewed as a trusted advisor in the space. Uh, but you know, essentially what we do is we support companies uh, when it comes to their uh, kind of evaluating strategic options. So that might be raising a round of growth equity, that might be looking at a potential exit. Uh, we also get hired uh, with, uh, uh, on the buy side, uh, and, and that's with folks that are large, uh, oftentimes public uh, cybersecurity companies. Uh, I mean, we have work with clients uh, kind of across the globe. Inter we have international clients, we have clients here in North America, uh, APAC. Uh, so really, we're, we're a global firm uh, with the headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, and, uh, and we work with folks really just to, 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 to help them focus on uh, potential investments, acquisitions, partnerships all across the cybersecurity ecosystem. Uh, so pretty, pretty agnostic in terms of the sector within cyber that we work with. Uh, we have clients kind of across, uh, you know, probably all categories. Uh, we've been around for about six years now uh, as a firm and uh, really, uh, really glad to be on uh, with, uh, with you and uh, Dimitri. Dino, I met you in uh, Tel Aviv during Cyber Week in 2019. And I met you in Tel Aviv this February doing CyberTech, right before everything started and we stopped traveling. That is right. Why are you spending so much time in Tel Aviv? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, when you look at Tel Aviv, I mean, we're talking about a country that's you know probably a little bit smaller than the uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, but the last time I checked, it makes up for about fifteen percent of the world's cybersecurity companies, right? So we track roughly thirty five hundred companies uh, globally uh, at Momentum Cyber and in, in our Cyber Cloud database. Uh, five hundred plus of those companies are actually coming out of Tel Aviv which when you look at it from a concentration standpoint, I mean, we're talking, you know, probably an order of magnitude more concentrated as far as number of cyber companies per capita uh, than even the United States. So when it comes to uh, an amazing return on investment, um, in, in, uh, aside from the fact that I, I love actually traveling to Tel Aviv and I love the country itself, um, the cyber ecosystem there and the engineering and technology ecosystem, in my opinion, is, is really world-class. So before we move to our topic, SASE, we have a very important question to you. I think it's even more important than cybersecurity. What is your favorite hummus place and shawarma place in Tel Aviv? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, so far, I'm, I would say it's, it's not just the individual uh, uh, hummus places. I mean, I spend a lot of time over at Sorona Market. Um, and there's quite a few places there that I really love. Um, specifically, one of my favorite restaurants, it's called uh, Claro uh, over in, in Sorona. Um, so I would say that that's pretty high on my list. Uh, and there's a lot of just, I mean, one of my favorite things to do is just to walk around Tel Aviv and walking into some of the most unassuming places. And, and I've had some of the best, uh, some of the best uh, hummus and, uh, and uh, shawarma just in, in, in a random neighborhood in a random part of the city. So food there is amazing. It reminds me a lot. My, my, my family's Greek. Uh, so it reminds me very much of, uh, of Greece and, and just the time that I've spent in Athens and the culture, the people, the music. So, uh, yeah, just, just love it there. I agree. Serona is definitely very unique, a combination of different, different food. And unfortunately, I don't think such places exist in North America where you can just basically come and pick different food anywhere you want. Yeah, it's not, not very easy to find. I think there's uh, many versions of that, uh, I would say, but the, the international uh, flavor of Serona is just, it's really hard to find elsewhere. Great, great. So similar to Serona that has multiple different foods, SASE, <laughs> Secure Access Service Edge, has many different technologies. 
such as CASB, Secure Web Gateway, DOP, Zero Trust, SDN, and a lot of other words in, in the alphabet. So the total addressable market is quite big. And I'm wondering from your perspective, because me and Dimitri see it more from a technical perspective and architecture, but we know really well that if there is no capital, if there is no marketing, if there is no money, it's very, very hard to sell. And it's very, very hard to tell the world that you have a good product. Yeah, that, that is very true. Um, I would say when, when we look at the, uh, when we look at the SASE market, I think I, to some extent you have to come back to technology a bit, right? Um, the reason I say that is because when you say SASE, I think, especially nowadays, um, SASE means so many different things to so many different people. And it seems to be kind of this amalgamation of uh, a lot of core uh, network technologies coupled with core security technologies. Um, but when you start looking at the individual components that make up of a it's almost like a, it's not just a SASE solution. It's almost like a SASE, you know, methodology, if you will, kind of like uh, zero trust. People like to say zero trust and there's not truly, you know, a zero trust company that's out there. There's pieces that when put together, I think you have a SASE solution. Now, don't get me wrong. There are SASE companies that are out there that will have a majority of the features. And I think it's fair for them to say that they are, you know, a, 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 you know, a SASE solution in the marketplace. Um, but the way I look at it, it is an amalgamation of the SD-WAN world, DLP. You have, of course, firewall and you know, secure web gateway. So those markets in and of themselves are massive markets, especially when you look at the, the firewall and kind of the traditional, you know, appliance-based firewall market. Um, these markets are huge. Now, do those markets get uh, completely displaced with the SASE solution? I don't believe that's going to be the case, or at least not anytime soon. So it's not like it's a mutually exclusive type market sizing uh, exercise. There's, you know, overlapping circles, so to speak, of concentric circles or and overlapping circles in, in, the, in like a, a Venn diagram of capabilities. Um, I think the bottom line is that if you look at any one of those markets, I think it's a large market in and of itself. If you look at a market that is trying to pull significant pieces away from the, you know, the secure web gateway market, for example, I think is much closer to what people traditionally think of as the SASE market than the CASB market per se. Now that doesn't mean that you won't see overlapping functionalities, um, but I think there's some markets that are, you know, uh, if I was doing a, a weighted, you know, uh, weighted average or kind of a, a weighting of saying, okay, uh, how much of the secure web gateway market is in SASE? How much of the firewall market would I include in SASE? I think those are probably the top two contributors. Um, and then I think the rest, there's, you know, there's some new market share, right? Because SASE allows, um, allows companies that maybe can't afford to have a firewall vendor, DLP, uh, SWIG, SD-WAN, can't really afford to have this best of breed uh, type world where they themselves are piecing together all these technologies and, and, and the crazy overhead you would need to really manage that type of architecture. So I do think that there's new opportunities for um, more, you know, call them simplified and in more best of suite type SASE companies. Uh, but I think the bottom line is the market is massive. And if you start looking at taking away market share from firewall, just uh, one market alone, it's it just the opportunity here is, is tremendous. Do you think SASE is a good term? Oh, it's confusing people, customers, investors. You know, I think the the term and when you really look at some, I mean, I know Gartner came out with their report last fall and they really started this whole discussion um, around SASE. I think, I think the term is fine. I think that the, the concept makes a lot of sense. And I think when you look at into their um, into their uh, into their materials, it, it, it uh, intuitively I, I I understand kind of what they're getting at, and I think that's great. Where I think there's confusion is what the market and the, frankly, the companies that are out there, what they've done with the term SASE, right? There's so much, you know, noise in the market and that 
somebody that had a, let's say traditionally were a VPN player that's layering in some level of security, they call themselves sassy. Somebody that has a CASB solution uh, that is now, you know, spinning up points of presence around the world uh, and trying to offer more functionality that you would see in like a Zscaler or iBoss, let's say, uh, they're calling themselves uh, a sassy players. Uh, DLP players that add this kind of functionality, they grab on to sassy. SD-WAN is probably the biggest one um, that I've seen that uh, almost every SD-WAN player I've come across has now some type of sassy um, uh, uh, lingo on their website. So I think the market is successfully confusing uh, one another or companies are confusing one another and confusing chief security officers because you can't just look at, oh, this company says they do sassy. You have to double click and it probably gets to more of, of, of you know, Dimitri, of getting your guys' world. You have to double click on the technology to see which aspects of sassy are these companies actually satisfying and uh, really evaluate them on a, on a capability, uh, from a capability perspective. At least that, that's my opinion. SASE is very interesting. Sometimes it really sounds like a salad of multiple technologies combined together, but, but overall, it's, to me, it looks like SASE is the holistic solution that includes all of these smaller capabilities and smaller functionalities for security of organization that combine into one thing and uh, infused on top of that with the cloud capabilities. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, uh, you know, in your opinion, how crowded the space is right now? Yeah, you know, I guess it depends on, it really ties back to this last point we were discussing. It, it depends on how you define the space. I think um, I think my previous comment is, is how I would frame it. I, I don't believe it's too crowded. I, I believe it's too noisy. Um, and, it, and because it's too noisy, it's too confusing. And because everyone is claiming to be a sassy solution, um, you know, they might check the box of a handful of these functionalities and they claim sassy it makes it appear that, wow, there's all these sassy vendors. And in reality, not really, right? You know, uh, and, and I won't get into, you know, calling out specific companies, but uh, a lot of companies, they claim to be sassy, but in reality, they're an SD-WAN vendor, which is a critical component of it. But in reality, they know SD-WAN, they're experts in the SD-WAN space, and no amount of, you know, marketing dollars is going to make suddenly give them all these other capabilities but you know they're calling themselves you know sassy players and i think there's a ton of synergy between the two and there's uh, a lot of partnerships happening right now with kind of the core you know the true kind of sassy or maybe more secure web gateway and and, and true network security delivered in the cloud uh companies that are working with these sd-wan vendors but um but i think that's one example where you know they're claiming to be sassy players and i don't necessarily view them as competitors um, at least not yet. Uh, I think there's a lot of investment they're going to have to make to truly have a competitive solution. Um, and, and I think the same is going to be true for the firewall vendors that are stitching together, you know, some kind of sassy solution. I think the same is going to be true for, you know, just a, a wide variety of folks that are pivoting into the space. Um, or maybe not pivoting or repackaging, if you will, and, and, and certainly focusing on the development of capabilities to have a more holistic solution. Um, but I think when you look at just pure play sassy, sassy vendors that are out there, there's not that many in my opinion. So you mentioned firewalls, you mentioned CASB, Secure Web Gateway. So we know all the major firewall vendors have a solution, a type of solution. We know all the major security web gateway have tech solution. We also, as you mentioned, some SD-WAN vendors and some pure cloud native guys as well. And by the way, Cosby guys also in the space. So I'm wondering what about the big companies such as Microsoft, AWS, and Google that has their own infrastructure as a service have now some security components as well. What do you see on the market? Do you think they will go into the space? Would they buy someone? Would they create the capabilities by themselves? That's a great question. I mean, I think, I think part of that comes down to how much responsibility do these players want to take in security? I think until now, and maybe Microsoft is probably the furthest along as far as the moves they made in the security space and in their product portfolio. 
um, to, you know, openly say we, we will be responsible for security to some extent, right? With their, they have, you know, their SIM product line and AD and Intune and ATP and, and all the solutions that they have. Um, but overall, the question becomes how much do they really want to own the security? Um, or do they want to take more of a partnership marketplace? I mean, we've seen the work that AWS and Security Hub has done. Um, you know, they've built a ton of functionality inside their platform. They've acquired some companies and, and they have more of a marketplace designed to partner with vendors. And I think we'll still see more of the same there. Uh, I do believe that the opportunity is there. They have this global footprint, this global infrastructure. They don't yet own, you know, I kind of see SASE almost like securing the connectivity uh, piece, so to speak, the traffic itself. They don't yet own that connectivity piece. Uh, but I think it's a natural fit for them. And I think acquiring in this space, potentially building in this space, uh, I, I, I do believe is, 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 uh, is the direction they should head. They also have a browser. So Microsoft has Edge, Google has Chrome. So they can potentially have the capabilities right inside the browser. So it'll be interesting yeah, to you see. Could, you could start with that, I think. As people start thinking through more just the you know core you know ZTNA type capabilities that may not be perfectly you know browser based, I think there might be some limitations. But to have a browser based solution, I think would be pretty easy for them to uh, to do so. I think it, it's really interesting. Actually, I never thought about the browser angle, but obviously, I think Google has a leg up with their you know Chrome browser. Um, and but having this kind of a solution could be another way to uh, to, to gain more market share in the, in the battle Actually, of the browsers as well. I'm not, when you, not sure what AWS will do. <laughs> but, when you uh, mention about Google, they have Beyond Corp. Yep. It's actually a remote access solution. Yep. And I think they announced around two months ago. Uh, it's full availability, and they now sell it as a ZTNA product. Yep. So yep, it's part of SASE. You know, and I you... think that is, and I think that is the direction the market is headed. So there's, there, I, there, if, if there's anything that I, I do not doubt is that there will be many, many uh, moves that are made in the space, strategic activity, investments, M and A, uh, kind of organic development by some of these tech titans. I think there's going to be a lot of activity, and we saw, we saw the beginning of it. You know, really the beginning of it happen, you know, happening this year with you know Palo Alto and, and Cloudgenics and. Um, Silver Peak getting acquired and, and others. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing the chips start to um, kind of uh, fall and, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this market unfolds over the next, call it 12 to 24 months. What are the recent notable transactions you have seen in this space and you can talk about? Yes, I mean, we've seen a, f a few, right? I, um, so mentioning, you know, Paolo picking up Cloudgenics, as I'd say, was the first notable one. I think that was about a $420 million deal. Uh, we saw in, 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 in the, uh, the SD-WAN space, we saw uh, HPE uh, picking up Silver Peak, uh, almost a billion dollar deal, uh, probably about a month or so ago that it was announced. We saw some smaller kind of Acquihire and or Tucken acquisitions. There's uh, most recently, I think there's a company Adaptive Networks uh, and, and, and Elfique Networks. I think that was a sub million dollar deal. I think Fortinet picked up uh, Opaque uh, this, this past month as well as, you know, smaller deal. So I think there's, there's definitely activity occurring on the strategic front. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of activity that occurred a few years back of, of folks that were buying uh, SD-WAN vendors. My personal opinion is anyone who owns SD-WAN vendor today is really thinking hard about how do we either partner or ultimately, uh, you know, probably acquire in the space as well. Um, so when you start to look at, you know, Cisco's got Viptela and VMware's got Velo Cloud and, um, you know, even just some of the pure play SD-WAN vendors we talked about, I think all of them are thinking about this market and they can either try to build it organically if they're, you know, well-funded enough or, you know, if, if there's someone like a Cisco or a VMware, sure, they, they, can, uh, they can take that route. Um, otherwise, I do expect to see more consolidation around SD-WAN, you know, just uh, SASE. I think the, what we saw on the financing side was a little bit more of, money flowing into the space from folks maybe um you know pivoting or repackaging and, and 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 going into this market like netscope for example probably the largest cap raise we saw in the beginning of this year is about 350 million dollars 
um, you know, uh, obviously a juggernaut in the Casby space and, and really making waves in the SASE market. Um, you know, obviously that, that's a lot of money that they raise, but at the same time, it, it is a significant investment that they're going to need to make to their kind of global pop infrastructure, their platform. I mean, this is, this is not really the world that Netscope was playing in. So, um, you know, so we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, potential there, of course, uh, but I also see it's, it's, uh, there's, there's some technology uh, risk uh, ahead for them as well. It's not like it's just a scaling uh, question. So, you know, uh, spending money on their Casby's business, I think it's just pouring fuel on the fire. Um, when it comes to their sassy business, I almost view that as, as kind of a, a VC stage investment within, a, within a, a large successful CASB player. So I think that'll be interesting. Um, similarly, you know, Cato Networks raised a, a pretty large round. I think mostly I want to say it was from existing investors. I don't have that in front of me here, but um, I think around 70, $80 million round that they did earlier this year. Again, a player and, you know, strong player in the SD-WAN space moving into this market. Um, you know, I, I assume we'll continue to focus on kind of the, the, the enterprise space uh, and then most recently, we saw Perimeter 81 uh, Insight uh, put another $40 million into the company after I think there was $20 million uh, earlier this year that uh, P81 raised and, and, and now Insight is, uh, has stepped in and cut a pretty big check for them. Uh, I think they target slightly lower uh, in the market and they're not really going after the upper end of the enterprise or historically they hadn't been. Um, you know, strong roots in the VPN world and now when you start coupling the VPN capability and, and you think of it as a way to securely connect and you layer in security functionality, I think it starts to um, to, to look and feel and, and really be more of a sassy type uh, solution as well. Uh, but you, you may not see them going, let's say, head to head with Zscale or at like a, you know, a global 100, uh, for example, or, or see them come into uh, deals against like iBoss, for example. So, um, you know, still lot, lots of activity, lots of money flowing into the space. So it'll be interesting to see how, how these folks go after the incumbents. Um, and, and, and I would say the next gen cloud type solutions, like we talked about, uh, you know, Zscaler and iBoss. You know, I'm wondering if I'm a small company that want to start today and I'm decided I'm sassy, what's my chances? How do I present myself? How do I go to the big guys, to the fortune 500? How do I differential myself? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a wonderful question. I, and, uh, you know, if I were a small company or early stage company or someone starting off today, I, I, I would, I would, I would really think long and hard about is, is Sassy the place where you, you know, quote unquote, start a company today. And the reason I say that is, I mean, it's a significant investment and, and unless you're, providing a SASE solution in a, in a very innovative way that maybe, you know, flips today's model on its head. Um, I don't know how easy it is to, to really get into this market unless you have kind of significant capital behind you. And what I mean by that is you can't really build out a global network of, you know, points of presence and going up against companies that have, you know, a hundred plus points of presence around the globe. Um, it's really hard to have a solution uh, that's going to compete with them without a you know, major, major investment. Um, and then you could argue, well, why can't we just leverage some of the existing cloud infrastructure that's out there and try to build this on Google, AWS? I think you could do that. I think your gross margins are going to take a significant hit. Um, and especially when you're dealing with lower volumes, lower bandwidth and, and kind of lower scale, um, it's, it's probably, it's, it's not very easy to do so. So if I were... If I were a company thinking about starting in this space, I would really think long and hard is, is there a way to um, kind of redefine the model or is there a way to offer the services in a way that perhaps the current, um, the current model, maybe you can, uh, you know, flip it on its head, if you will. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. I just think it's, uh, it's one of those areas that does require quite a bit more investment, at least in the current way that folks are delivering this kind of service. So the disruption opportunity there is from the business model perspective. I mean, technologically, there is nothing to innovate, right, in this space. Well, I mean, you guys are the technology experts, I'll admit. Um, but uh, on the surface, uh, from what we see, we haven't really come across technology limitations or security limitations. And, and it's not like 
Um, we haven't come across folks that are like, yeah, you know, I, I would do this, except it doesn't, gil- you know, it doesn't deliver the level of service or security that I need. I mean, that that's not the, the the problem that I think exists in the market. I do think there's some opportunity for business model innovation, uh, but how do you deliver the type of secure connectivity, reliable connectivity, low latency connectivity um, around the globe without investing in, 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 uh, in kind of a global infrastructure or just paying for it as you use it. Um, but like you said, it, it creates a business model challenge. If you want to start a SaaS company, you need to be very innovative from the business perspective. And you need to know that there is not many pure play SaaS companies out there. Uh, yeah, I'd say from from our perspective, and, and and we typically are looking at companies that are more, I'd say, well established in the market. Uh, perhaps you guys spend a little bit more time, maybe at the earlier kind of seed stage or, or you know Series A or incubator uh, type companies. I, I'm sure there's there's probably solutions that are being you know uh, you know developed as we speak, and and there are other players in the market. I think it's just um, to have a sassy solution that delivers the type of performance functionality, um, especially when we talk about to the enterprise market, right? And, and, and the reason I bring that up, it's not just the global kind of uh, points of presence. There's also the challenge of, you know, you're gonna be going up against folks and, and, and trying to, you know, take out, you know, let's say a, a blue coat instance or some of these, you know, legacy incumbent solutions that are there the amount of policies that you have to uh, try to seamlessly transfer over into your SASE solution, it, it, it's, it's a heavy lift. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a trivial task. So it's not just what capabilities are you offering, but you need to have a technology that is mature enough to be able to shift off of other uh, solutions that are then, you know, baked into these companies for five, 10, 15 years uh, and to be able to actually get them to shift and migrate onto your platform. I think there's, there's just, um, there's a lot of investments and, and you really need a fully baked uh, platform that has significant time, energy, and resources before you can actually deliver SASE in a way that allows you to go after the upper end of the market. Right, right. Well, maybe, maybe you know, someone can solve the pop point of presence problem using uh, Elon Musk's Starlink. <laughs> yeah, that could be no doubt there will be innovation in this space uh but yeah the, the key is will it be business model will it be technology the, the underlying infrastructure i think there's there's uh there's lots of potential uh but uh so far we we haven't uh come across folks that uh, that are not you know companies that were started call it i don't know five ten years ago uh at least well when it comes to the investor community what are the investment multipliers uh, investor expect to see from SASE companies? Yeah, I think it's tricky uh, mainly because uh, since we're talking about um, kind of many different markets that you're looking at, when you try to look at comparables, for example, uh, you know, the, the closest comp to a pure play SASE company would be Zscaler in the market, right? They're trading at 30 times revenue. Um, so I know a lot of investors and, and, and even strategics, I'm sure their, their biggest nightmare is to try to figure out how to justify that this company they're about to acquire or invest shouldn't be comped against Zscaler. And I, and I think they probably wish Zscaler wasn't trading that high. Um, but when you look at Zscaler trading at, you know, a 30 X multiple level, you look at some of these SD WAN deals that we talked about trading anywhere from you know six to seven x on the low end to 20 times revenue or arr on the upper end i think um i I think you you end up in a situation that you know and and again we focus more on the growth stage you're probably looking at a you know 10 to 20 x type uh arr multiples that uh, most of these discussions are having obviously there could be situations where you're a little bit lower than that you could be higher than that if you have you know uh, quite a bit of traction and, and growth or or if you're knocking down, you know, some monster clients, and and uh, and, and and you have quite a bit of momentum with uh, with customers. So um, there's no there's no magic formula, but um, you know, really, it's it's like there's comps in that 30 range in the public markets, and anywhere from you know uh, seven to to 20, 25 x uh, when you look at uh, M and A or, or even uh, growth equity rounds that are happening right now. Awesome. Uh, it was a very good conversation. I think we're almost off top of our half an hour. I do have one interesting question that's not SASE related, but potentially maybe SASE related. 
the endpoint security market is huge. And I think one of the latest Gartner report were mentioned about endpoint and potentially SASE. Do you think that some of the endpoint players may try to get to this market as well? That's an interesting question. Um, I believe there's a natural partnership for this market. Yeah, like CrowdStrike at Netscope, CrowdStrike and Zscaler, I know, Sentinel One, there's a number of vendors that try to have a technology partnership with SASE vendors. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, not something that I've, I've thought of in the past, but let, you know, a lot of these SASE vendors will have some kind of agent that you put onto the endpoint, uh, and you know they will have kind of a presence on the endpoint, if you will, or partnering with someone to to, to bake in uh, capabilities like EDR capabilities. I could see that direction. I'm not so sure if I was a company that is sitting on an endpoint absent that back end kind of global infrastructure. I'm not so sure how they would really move into the space unless a they were innovative from a, a business model and infrastructure perspective that allowed them to not build up the points presence uh, or b maybe they could just invest in the space and obviously some of the EDR vendors are very well capitalized so um, I don't I don't think that's out of the question um, but going from an endpoint company to being kind of a, a network security uh, delivered in the cloud uh, you know true true competitor that seems like a pretty big leap to me. Yeah, we saw some companies uh, during our interviews that actually use Endpoint for inspection, some of the Cosby companies. Yep. I also know several Endpoint security companies that have a light type of URL filtering, but it's again, it's uh, just a small part. Like I think Komodo Security, the Endpoint has a very small uh, footprint of URL filtering, but it doesn't mean they cannot you know, invest money and technology to go there. So we'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. The big question would just be how how will how could companies like that uh, cost effectively scale, right? And what is what do the economics look like uh, if they were to do that? And and I just don't know the answer. It's I think it's a it's a good food for thought. Awesome, Dino. Thank you very much. Anything else you want to bring before we? Well, this, is, this has been great. I'm really glad to reconnect with you guys. I, I, uh, I look forward to uh, running into you again, uh, hopefully uh, one day in, in Tel Aviv soon, but uh, if not there, uh, uh, somewhere else when the skies you know, fully reopen and we're all uh, safe and, uh, and, and comfortable traveling. We know for sure uh, what restaurant you like. <laughs> and any, anytime you want to meet at Claro, I'm in. You know, if people want to find you on Momentum Cyber, what is the easiest things to do? Where they should go? Oh, our uh, so momentumcyber.com, uh, our website. If you go there, there's a team page, and you can reach out to any one of us. Uh, and also, I think more importantly, as a resource uh, for for your listeners, uh, momentumcyber.com, we have an Intel page, and on the Intel page, uh, we have everything from the Cyberscape, which is our kind of industry taxonomy, if you will, that we slice up the market into, I believe, 42 subsectors. Um, it's a bit of an eye chart. There's many logos. It's only about a quarter of the companies that we actually track in our database, maybe one fifth at this point in time. Um, so you'll see the cyberscape on there. And then we also have all of our monthly snapshots, quarterly market reviews, cyber almanac, special reports, uh, you know, some special white papers that we have as well. So I think that's a, that's a great resource. Uh, it, it's, it's free and open uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to download for kind of internal usage. And then also, if you want to be on our mailing list, you feel free to sign up on that same Intel page. And we're happy to, to, to mail out uh, our, uh, our information to you. Right now, we have about, I want to say, 15,000 subscribers uh, that subscribe to our material. So if any, any of your listeners want to subscribe, just send them there. We'll definitely link in the show notes about links and where they should go. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Dino. Thank you guys, it's been a pleasure. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.